of the David S. Solomon Provocative Lecture Series this semester. My name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer with the Economics Department. Um, you don't have to sit in back. I know a lot of my students like to sit in back because they think I won't pick on them, but you guys are welcome to move forward and fill in. Um, before we go any further, let's have everybody turn off their cell phones and other alter egos so we won't be interrupted. Um, also like to mention that we will have a meeting of the Barstool Economists after this, to which everyone is welcome, all of you. Uh, it will be at the Paramount Rotunda Lounge in the uh, center of the uh, Paramount Hotel. How are we doing that? Yep, good. Um, let me just make a couple of comments about that, uh, the uh, provocative lecture series. This was started in 2001. Um, this is to foster the economics department's vision of education here at San Jose State, which is challenging ideas and developing critical thinking in an environment of respect for intellectual intercourse. Um, as we have said before, we want you to relax, ponder, and enjoy Professor Tabarak as he discusses his extensive research on the FDA. We will provide a question and answer session at the end of the presentation to allow the audience to explore the specifics with him. And it is our hope that our lecture series will allow a, thorough a more thorough understanding of this topic. And we look forward to your comments. Um, please welcome Professor Alex Tabarak from the Mercatus Center, where he's the uh, Bartley J. Madden Chair of Economics. Uh, he's also an associate professor of economics at George Mason University, as well as a research director for the Independent Institute. His, in, uh, his research um, interests are wide-ranging. They include tort reform, bounty hunters, judicial electoral, electoral systems, voting theory, and alternative political institutions, health economics, and particularly the FDA and the administration of the Food and Drug Act. He is a co-author of an extensive uh, website on the FDA, fdareview.org. He is editor of a number of books, including Voluntary City, uh, Entrepreneurial Economics, and Changing the Guard. He's also co-author with Tyler Cohen of a new set of introductory, uh, introductory texts in both micro and macroeconomics. Ah, my copy is down there, uh, which I brought for signing. Hopefully, our audience will be receptive enough so that he will consent to sign my book when we're done. We can only, we can only hope. Please come on in and sit down. Um, you will notice that there's some sample copies out in the lobby, as well as the publisher is here to discuss the book if anyone is interested. And I hope you, you will avail yourselves of them and of representatives of Aplia who are also here. Um, before we get started, I know that Rick Weber, who is the president of the Economics Department, would like to come up very briefly and make a statement. Um, and I understand that we are videotaping this tonight. Um, and with the help of IRC, we'll be able to have the streaming to you um, in the very short order. So you'll have access to this if you can't see the whole thing tonight, or if others would like to see it as well. Here, Rick. Thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Rick. Rick. Uh, President of Econ Club. I just want to let you guys know we have our website up now, sjseconclub.com. Uh, you can go on there, register, sign up for the forum, uh, help you find study groups, ask questions, meet people in the, in the department, have more fun with everyone, meet more people. Uh, we have our next meeting November 9th, that's a Monday at 4.15. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you very much. And without further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Alex Cabra. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jack. I really appreciate it. I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to be talking about, is the FDA safe and effective? And I'd like to begin with a simple example. Uh, it's only one example, but it's, I think, going to illustrate a number of the themes I'm going to be talking about uh, tonight. This is a uh, sensor pad. Okay? It's a very simple device. It's basically uh, two sheets of plastic with a uh, lubricant uh, in between. And the idea of the device is that it uh, enhances the sense of touch so that a woman might uh, detect a, a smaller breast lump 
uh, than my hand alone in an examination. So I'd like you guys to take a look at this device and uh, see whether you think this is a safe device, whether you think that it might possibly be effective, and whether you, if so, if you were in charge, uh, whether you would allow this device to be sold uh, in the United States. So I'm going to uh, toss it right out, just pass it around. There you go, Ned. Oh, take a look at that. And also I'd like you to think about how long would it take you to decide whether this device should be sold in the United States or not. Now, the sensor pad was uh, invented in 1986, and it was submitted to the FDA for approval. In Canada, the sensor pad was approved within uh, six days, and uh, just with 30 days and six pages of documentation. Uh, it was also approved in Europe, it was approved in Japan, it was approved in many other countries, but not in the United States. The FDA could find no previously approved device which was like the sensor pad. So they automatically classified it as a high-risk device, going on the bureaucratic theory that that which is new must be high-risk. Because it was classified as a high-risk device, it had to go through the highest levels of FDA scrutiny. And there we begin with a saga. To approve the device, the FDA asked for a number of clinical trials. Now at first, the manufacturer of the sensor pad, they were compliant. And they ran clinical trials showing that the sensor pad did indeed enhance the sense of touch and potentially could be used to detect a smaller breast lump than might otherwise be the case. The FDA, however, was not satisfied. They said, in order to get this product approved, you must prove that it reduces the mortality rate from breast cancer. In other words, the FDA told the manufacturer that to get this product approved, they would have to run a clinical trial with thousands of women, half of whom would get the sensor pad and instructions in its use, and half of whom would not. They would then have to follow those thousands of women for many years, for five years, perhaps for 10 years, until enough of them died of breast cancer in each group to be able to decide whether there was a statistically significant difference between the group which got the sensor pad and the group which did not. All of this to get a device approved which is substantially simpler than a toaster oven. Now the manufacturers, they knew this was the best now for the product. Because even if the FDA were to approve the product, eventually, down the line, after 10 years, okay, there was no possible way a product like this could be sold at a price high enough to recoup the cost of those clinical trials. Running clinical trials is extremely expensive. Multi-millions of dollars to run these clinical trials. So there was no possible way we could set a price high enough where people would be willing to buy this product to recoup the cost of those, costs, of those trials. Now at this stage, most firms would simply give up and the product would disappear, would never to be heard from again. The manufacturers of the sensor pad, however, did something very unusual. We defied the FDA. And they started to sell the sensor pad to doctors and to hospitals around the country. And doctors and hospitals began giving away the sensor pad uh, to women. The FDA, however, was not to be defied so easily. So in 1989, on behalf of American women, in armed raids, the FDA raided hospitals, they raided doctor's offices, they raided the manufacturer of the sensor pad, and they confiscated all of these devices. Well, the case then went to the courts, where it dragged on for many years, until in 
until the Wall Street Journal and then ABC's 2020 got hold of this case and publicized it. That led to congressional hearings. Okay. And at these congressional hearings, a number of doctors testified in favor of the center pad, as did some women who said that the center pad had saved their lives. Well, now, with all of this pressure on them, on the FDA, the FDA finally agreed to allow the center pad to be sold. Except, they got in their, their days, because they said, believe it or not, believe it or not, they said this product could only be sold with a doctor's prescription. It was not until even several years after that that the product was finally approved for sale to the public. Now, I will be the first to uh, uh, say that uh, this is just uh, an, an absurd example, an extreme example of uh, FDA failure. Nevertheless, I tell this not simply to beat up on the FDA, although that could be important too, but because this story illustrates a number of lessons which I think are of general importance. The first lesson from the Center Pad story is that other countries uh, sometimes do a better job of approval. And this is true not just for medical devices, not just for the center pad, but in fact for many drugs and devices. In fact, between uh, uh, 1970 and 1993, and I'll explain that the date's a little bit later, the FDA clearly lagged behind its counterparts in many European countries in approving new drugs. Now, if this lag resulted in greater safety, then fine. But that's testable. So if the lag resulted in greater safety, then we would expect to see fewer post-market safety withdrawals in the United States than in other countries. So Great Britain and Spain, for example, each approved more drugs during this time period than did the United States. In the United States, approximately 3% of all drug approvals were withdrawn for safety reasons. In Spain, approximately 3% of all drugs approvals were withdrawn for safety reasons. In Great Britain, a little bit higher, approximately 4% of all drug approvals were withdrawn for safety reasons. Overall, there's no evidence that US drug lag brought greater safety. Indeed, quite, quite the opposite. So reviewing this, uh, Wardella Lasagna said, in view of the clear benefits demonstrable from some of the drugs introduced into Britain, it appears the United States has lost more than it has gained from adopting a more conservative approach. The basic lesson here is that drug lag can kill. Drug lag can kill. Uh, deaths owing to drug lag have been numbered in the hundreds of thousands. So Wardell estimated that tens of thousands of people may have died who could have lived during the years in which just one drug, beta blockers, were available in Europe, but not in the United States. And of course, deaths occur not simply from delay relative to Europe, but from delay period, from drug lag period. This, of course, is the essence of trade-offs. Trade-offs. We can do, yes, we can do more testing. And that has some benefits, but it also has costs. The greater the amount of time it takes to test a drug, to have a drug approved, to run it through the trials, to get it approved by the FDA, that means that good drugs are delayed just as much as bad drugs. And during the time that we have delay, there are people dying who could have lived had those drugs been available sooner. Drug lag can kill. I think the sensor pad story also introduces another uh, idea, kind of a, a really obvious one in my view, okay? and that is reciprocity. So other countries sometimes do a better job of approving drugs than the United States. So why not? If another industrialized country like Britain or Germany, okay, not like Thailand, let's say, but let's say Britain, Germany, Sweden, Japan, whatever you want, 
Okay? If they approve a medical device or drug, that drug or device ought to get automatic approval in the United States within, say, 90 days. This seems to me a blindingly obvious reform. There really is no reason why the FDA needs to duplicate research done by its counterpart in the European, in, in the European Union or, or vice versa. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, suppose that you were a patient in Germany and your doctor prescribed a drug. Would you say to your doctor, doctor, I can't take this drug unless it's already been approved by the American FDA. Do you think Germans ask their doctor, has this drug been approved by the gold standard by the Americans? No. No, clearly not. And if you wouldn't require that if you lived in Germany, and if Germans don't require it, why don't we have access to the same drugs that they have in Germany or Great Britain or other advanced industrialized countries? And of course, vice versa. But I think reciprocity is a very simple uh, idea, but a powerful one. The second lesson I want to talk about from the sensor pad story is to ask why was the sensor pad ultimately approved? It was ultimately approved because during the brief window of time that the product was available, doctors and patients learned what was going on. They learned what was going on. They learned that the FDA was preventing the marketing of a valuable product. Now this is not the usual case. Remember, during the brief window of time that the product was available, some women used the product and later argued that the sensor pad had saved their lives. So the media was able to put a face, a face on the issue, to identify someone who was harmed by the FDA and to make it a big deal. Now contrast this with the usual situation. Ordinarily, we never learn about products that the FDA fails to approve. We don't learn about products that could have saved lives but didn't because they were in the FDA pipeline, because they were delayed. We don't see the products which are never produced because FDA regulations raise the costs of new production so high that they never come into existence, that they are never researched and developed in the first place. So this is one reason why battling the FDA is so difficult. Because when the FDA releases a bad drug onto the market and people die, everyone knows it. But when people die because the FDA has delayed a good drug or because FDA costs have made it uneconomic to produce a drug which could have saved lives, those people are statistical deaths. They're hard to identify with a specific person. You can't put a face on those people. Those people may not even know, the loved ones may not even know that their loved one could have lived had newer drugs been available sooner. These people are hardly even recognized or acknowledged. Even though many more people may die because good drugs are delayed and lost than are saved because bad drugs are not approved. This raises the issue of what economists and statisticians call type one and type two error. So, oops, uh -oh, uh -oh. type one error is the one we all know about. That's when the FDA allows a drug onto the market and the drug turns out to have some serious side effects. Okay? In this case, the victims are identifiable. Johnny Smith of 110 East Main Street dies because the FDA allowed a harmful drug onto the market. Everyone knows it. Johnny's parents can go on Oprah and discuss their very real tragedy and the FDA's mistake. Heads at the FDA will roll. But when the FDA fails to approve a good drug that could have saved Johnny's life, Johnny's parents may never even learn that he might have been saved. This is type two error. Okay. when the FDA fails to allow a beneficial drug onto the market. Type uh, two error may even be more serious than type one error, because by its very nature, type one errors are self-correcting. We learn of the mistake and we fix it. While type two errors 
when the FDA fails to approve a drug which could save lives, thousands of people may die every year who could have been saved while these drugs are languishing in the pipeline and no one knows it. So you can lose thousands of lives and the error is not self-corrected. For this reason, I think the FDA spends much too much time worrying about type one error than about type two error, because that's what their incentives are. Let's look at FDA incentives. Here's physician Henry Miller, He's former head of the FDA's Office of Biotechnology. He described the incentives. Remember, remember economics, politicians and bureaucrats, voters, they all respond to incentives. So when type one error is it obvious, when type one error means that heads will roll at the FDA and type two error is forgotten or ignored, which error are people gonna pay attention to at the FDA? So here is the former head of the FDA's Office of Biotechnology. He says, in the early 1980s, when I headed the team at the FDA that was reviewing the NDA, that's new drug application, for recombinant human insulin, we were ready to recommend approval a mere four months after the application was submitted, at a time when the average time for NDA review was more than two and a half years. With quintessential bureaucratic reasoning, my supervisor refused to sign off on the approval, even though he agreed that the data provided compelling evidence of the drug's safety and effectiveness. If anything goes wrong, he argues, think how bad it will look that we approve the drug so quickly. That's FDA incentives, all on type one error, not on type two error, I think to the detriment of American patients. Here's the third lesson from the sensor pad story. Costly clinical trials can make a product uneconomic to produce, even when the product would benefit patients. So this is the problem of drug loss as opposed to drug lag. How many drugs are lost because it is too expensive to go through the research and development process, go through the FDA process? And what is the value of the drugs that don't exist because the costs are too high? You know, it now costs over $800 million to produce the average new drug over $800 million to produce the average new drug. That means that many new drugs are not produced because the firms know the market is not large enough to make those drugs profitable. They are not produced because the costs of production are too high, so they never even enter the research and development pipeline. This, by the way, is what a new drug application looks like. Uh, typically, 100,000 pages would not be unusual. This is actually a small new drug application. It's inherently difficult to get a good grip on the extent of drug loss. But uh, Sam Peltzman, University of Chicago economist, one of the earliest persons to investigate the costs and benefits of the FDA. He analyzed uh, some fascinating, but also some disturbing data. So prior to 1962, the FDA had authority over safety only. They could review a drug for safety only. Uh, after 1962, they had much, much increased powers to review a drug for both safety and for e efficacy as well. So what happened in 62? Why did the FDA powers increase? Thalidomide, thalidomide, exactly correct. So thalidomide was a drug, it was actually not approved in the United States. It was approved in some European countries. It was used to treat morning sickness. It turned out that when taken at a uh, specific time in a pregnancy, that it resulted in severely deformed uh, children. Children were sealed in with chopped off limbs. So at the time, this created a huge media uproar, of course. And as often happens, as often happens, bureaucracies grow uh, during times of crisis. 
So maybe you know your Peter. Bureaucracies grow during times of crisis. Notice, by the way, that the issue was never whether thalidomide was effective, was effective or not. Uh, and thalidomide has not actually been approved in the United States because of delay. So the response to the crisis, giving the FDA uh, control over efficacy as well as over safety, had actually nothing to do with the crisis itself. Uh, nevertheless, this is how bureaucracies grow, whether the uh, response uh, matches the crisis or not, bureaucracies grow during the crisis period. So, FDA powers increased tremendously around 1962. So here's what Peltzman did. So Peltzman looked uh, uh, at the number of uh, uh, NCEs as new chemical entities, new drugs. Okay? Uh, the blue line is the number of new drugs. Okay? And first of all, he looked from 1948 to uh, about 1962, so, so pre-1962. And he created a model of the drug market. Okay? And you can see the red line in it is his model of the expected number of new chemical entities given various factors in the drug market. And you can see that between 48 and 62, that is prior to 62, his model fits the data very well. Okay. After 1962, the model is predicting an average number of uh, new chemical entities per year of 40 per year. The actual number, given by the blue line, 16 per year. So Peltzman's model is telling us what we could have expected had the FDA's powers not increased dramatically in 1962. Indeed, you could see it another way simply by looking at the pre-average number of new drugs per year, 41 per year, and compare that with the post-average, just 16 new drugs per year. So, and one can see why this happened. Prior to 1962, new, to, get a, uh, to research and develop a new drug might take one or two years. After 1962, that number started to go up dramatically. So by the 1970s, it was taking 10, 12, 14, 15 years to get a new drug approved. And the cost of new drug development going up extensively. And the result, fewer new drugs. So we've seen so far that the FDA can create drug lag and drug loss. Now, I want to talk about safety because this is what the FDA is supposed to do. We create more safety. So let's look at safety. The sad truth, but an important truth, is that all efficacious drugs have side effects. All efficacious drugs have side effects. And it's impossible to determine all serious side effects before a drug is approved. So on new drugs, we are all guinea pigs. Patients are guinea pigs. That is an uncomfortable truth, but it is the truth. Now, why is this? Well, think about the following. Suppose we have a new drug, and let's just say that there is a, uh, the drug has a side effect which causes a serious problem in one out of every thousand patients. So let's suppose you do a clinical trial on 4,000 patients, 2,000 of whom get the drug, 2,000 of whom get a placebo. If the drug has a serious side effect in one out of every thousand patients, you are highly unlikely to be able to pick that up in a clinical trial of 4,000 patients. And 4,000 patients is a big, expensive clinical trial. To run a clinical trial of 4,000 patients, tens of millions of dollars to follow those patients over time. So we are never going to learn about all of a drug's side effects before the drug was approved. This, in fact, was the problem with Vioxx. This was the story of Vioxx. So what happened is, in the early clinical trials, Vioxx showed no problems. But as several trials accumulated, problems began to appear. That is, we had, one, we had two studies, both of which showed no problems when taken alone, but when you did what was called a meta-analysis and put them together, then you began to see the problems. So that was the problem with Vioxx. Now, yes, we could have larger trials for longer periods of time. And when we do that, we will discover more, not all, 
but more side effects. But these clinical trials, as I have mentioned, are expensive. It is already costing $800 million to produce the average new drug. Greater expense means fewer new drugs. Longer trials means longer delays for drugs that do save lives. So it is quite possible, even likely, that longer and larger trials will harm more people than they benefit. It is possible to invest too much in safety, to require too many trials over too long a period of time, and the costs are fewer new drugs and good new drugs taking longer to reach the market. We also need to keep safety in perspective because we are concerned not simply with having safe drugs, but being safe from disease. Being safe from disease. Here, by the way, just to give you one example, this is um, deaths per 100,000 from AIDS. And you can see the absolutely dramatic decline in the mortality rate with the introduction of the uh, heart therapy in uh, 1996. More generally, at least one third of the increase in life expectancy since 1960 has been due to new and better pharmaceuticals. So we need to keep our eye on safety from disease, not simply safety of drugs. And the way to reduce the risk of disease is to maintain an innovative and an active market in new pharmaceuticals. And to do that, we need to keep the cost of producing new pharmaceuticals down. OK, I'm going to look at a couple of other things, further evidence on the cost of FDA regulation. I'm going to look at what physicians have to say about the FDA. They, after all, are on the front lines. So what they have to say may be of importance. And then I'm going to look at what we can learn from off-label prescribing, which I'll explain in a few minutes. First of all, what do physicians say about the FDA? Well, when asked, the FDA is too slow in approving new medical drugs and devices, 61% of physicians agree, 37% disagree. When asked, the additional time it takes for the FDA to approve medical drugs and devices costs lives by forcing people to go without potentially beneficial therapies. Pretty strong statement. 60% of physicians in a survey agree. These are cancer physicians. Now, what is off-label prescribing? Now, it's illegal to sell a new drug in the United States until the FDA has given its permission. Another way, another way of saying that, by the way, is that the FDA bans the sale of any new drug until it gives its permission. So it is banned until permitted. The sale of new drugs is banned until permitted. However, once a drug has been permitted for some use, it could be legally prescribed for any use. Now, it turns out this would not be important except for the fact that new uses for old drugs are being discovered all the time. And in cutting-edge fields uh, like cancer treatment and AIDS, often the gold standard is an off-label treatment. So off-label drug use is very common. So many drugs are given to patients for uses for which that drug was not approved of by the FDA. Most hospital patients will be prescribed at least one drug off-label. For some drugs, the majority of use is off-label. And it's not uncommon, as I said, especially in a field like uh, cancer research or AIDS research, for the gold standard treatment, for the very best treatment that modern medicine knows, is often an off-label treatment. So why does this happen? Why is off-label use so prevalent? Well, uh, one reason is, is that medical knowledge advances far faster than does the FDA. And medical knowledge advances faster than the FDA. 
So I'll give you an example. Uh, thalidomide, which we saw a few minutes ago, um, it actually was eventually approved again for something quite different than morning sickness. It was approved for the use of leprosy. But it was used, hardly ever used for leprosy. You don't see many lepers running around. Uh, it was used much more commonly to uh, treat cancer. Okay? It was used off-label. So it was approved to treat leprosy. It was used to treat cancer. In other words, doctors were, were using thalidomide to treat cancer long before the FDA approved that use, which eventually they did. The importance of this just illustrates that doctors have a wide source of approval information available to them other than the FDA. They were relying on the peer-reviewed literature, on other countries, on the US pharmacopoeia, on theory, and so forth. Okay. They rely on a lot of information beyond that of the FDA. So one reason we see a lot of uh, off-label use is that medical knowledge advances far faster than, you know, than the FDA. Another reason is that standard therapies, unfortunately, sometimes fail, even often fail. And when the standard therapies fail, it can be perfectly rational to try something which has a lower standard of evidence. Sometimes in the media, you will read that uh, off-label treatments are treatments which do not have scientific evidence behind them. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is true. But you cannot evaluate what is rational and what is safe globally for everybody at once. You have to look at an individual patient, at the treatment regime and the whole history, the whole treatment history of that patient. You have to look at the patient's circumstances of time and place. What do I mean? Well, it may be quite uh, 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 wrong, quite incorrect for a patient to use an off-label treatment as the first step. But if a patient has already tried the standard therapy and they have failed, and perhaps it's a life-threatening condition, then it may be perfectly reasonable to try something which is a little bit risky. An off-label treatment allows physicians to try and do that. And indeed, many new discoveries are made serendipitously, are made through this. Perhaps the most uh, uh, well-known example of this serendipitous discovery is uh, uh, Viagra. It was uh, originally researched as a treatment for a uh, heart disease. And uh, uh, the patients began uh, coming in and saying, well, doctor, I don't know about my heart, but there's some other things working pretty well. And so it became to be used for other uses as well. So standard treatments sometimes fail. Finally, patients are heterogeneous. What works for some patients often does not work for other patients. So it's extremely important for a doctor to have a whole wide arsenal of potential treatments. So when something fails, they can try something else. And off-label treatment provides that as well. Now, what do physicians say about off-label prescribing? Okay. So when asked, what would be your position on a proposal to change FDA law so that physicians could not prescribe drugs for off-label uses? So remember, an off-label use is a drug used for something for which it did not go through FDA efficacy trials. It has not been approved for that use. So what do physicians say about off-label prescribing? Would you favor or would you favor getting rid of it? Only 2% favor getting rid of it. 94% are in support of off-label prescribing and saying that this is extremely important to medical practice. Medical practice advances faster than the FDA, and if patients are to get the best treatments, we need to be able to prescribe off-label. This brings us to a second potential reform, safety only. Now notice, off-label prescriptions have not been through FDA-required efficacy testing in the off-label use. So off-label prescribing is a lot like prescribing a new drug that has been through FDA-required safety testing, but has not yet been through FDA-required efficacy tests. 
So using an old drug for a new use is quite like using a new drug for a use which has not been through, a new drug which has not been through efficacy trials. So since there are a lot of benefits to off-label prescribing, physicians are in favor of off-label prescribing, this suggests that allowing physicians to prescribe new drugs that have been safety tested only, that this might be also a good idea. So what do physicians say when they're asked about this? What would be your position on a proposal to change FDA law so that physicians could prescribe a new drug once the current FDA safety requirements had been met? In brief, what would be your position on a proposal to make the FDA efficacy standards an optional form of certification rather than a requirement as at present? Well, most said no, most opposed, 58%. But 27%, which I think is a remarkable number, were willing to buy into this really quite radical proposal. So this proposal is to take the FDA back to its pre-1962 level of regulation, to say that the FDA can regulate safety only really, but not efficacy. That's a radical proposal. 27% of physicians were willing to go along with it, which suggests to me that this is worthy of serious thought and consideration. And this is important because I was once asked, well, what would a world look like in which the FDA powers were significantly scaled back? And I answered, it would look like off-label prescribing does today. It is essential to medicine, exploratory, strongly supported by physicians, good for patients, innovative, forward-looking. So I think the importance and vitality of off-label prescribing reminds us that there is a voluntary approval system that operates outside the level of the FDA. And we should consider, consider moving the FDA back to a safety-only level of uh, testing. Okay. So I want to talk about some more reforms. Uh, I've already talked about reciprocity. I've talked about safety-only. I want to talk about uh, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which has a great acronym, which is PDUFA. I want to talk about PDUFA. And I want to talk about uh, post-market surveillance, advertising reforms, and then conclude by talking about moving from a paternalism model to a consumer reports model for the FDA. Okay. So let's talk about the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. This is one of the good uh, items. Okay, this is one of the, I think, one of the, the best, uh, one of the better laws which has been uh, passed and certainly has been a good law as far as the FDA is concerned. So prior to PDUFA, the FDA was funded by general revenues. This created this kind of ridiculous situation in which multi-million dollar drug proposals were held up, millions of dollars lost, patients harmed, simply because the FDA did not have enough funds to hire staff at $80,000 or $100,000 a year. So the NDA, the new drug application, simply sat, simply languished because the FDA did not have enough staff to look at it. Ridiculous. Well, finally, uh, the cost, uh, a bargain was struck. So the pharmaceutical firms agreed to help fund the FDA with a special tax if the FDA would agree to spend the money on speeding up the review of human drug applications. So PDUFA really was a win-win uh, innovation, and that's what happened. Uh, here's the story. Um, the uh, FDA staff levels increased, and the approval time uh, dropped the time from which the FDA got the new drug application to the time at which a decision was made, dropped from 30 months to uh, just 12 months. So the approval line is the approval time is the dark line, and the uh, dashed line is the new staff. So as we had PDUFA, the number of staff increased, and the approval time uh, went down. Now, there has been criticism of PDUFA, because uh, PDUFA revenues are a large fraction of the FDA's budget, about 40 to 50 percent of the human drug review budget. So there is a natural inclination to wonder whether the one paying the piper picks the tune. So Richard Horton, who is editor of The Lancet, uh, says that uh, the FDA, the Center for Dr uh, Drug Re Evaluation and Research in particular, has become a servant, a servant of industry. Now, I think there is a response to the critics. 
First of all, it appears that the primary reason that Padufa increased approval time was simply hiring more staff. And if Congress had hired more staff and allocated more budget to the FDA, the approval time would have also increased. So here was more of a case of uh, more money rather than where the money came from. However, I do want to say that you know, as a public choice economist, as somebody who recognizes incentives uh, in politics as well as in economics, I think there is some legitimate concern with a FDA which is funded out of pharmaceutical revenue. There is an issue uh, there. However, in this case, I believe that two wrongs do make a right, or at least make more of a right. That is, the FDA's uh, incentives to pay so much more attention to type 1 error, to delay so much, I think, are uh, uh, that if Padufa pushes the incentives back in the other direction, then we're probably better off as a result. Moreover, there's no evidence that Padufa increased the proportion of drugs which have been later withdrawn. The number increased because more drugs were approved, but the proportion did not change significantly. And Congress, they could have increased the FDA's budget at any time, but they chose not to, despite the fact that the social gains from faster approval of new drugs are extremely high. So to me, Padufa was a legitimate response to government failure, okay? to the failure of Congress to allocate enough funds to the FDA to approve new drugs, one of the most important functions that it could possibly have. So I think Padufa, uh, which periodically comes up, comes up every five years, I think it ought to be uh, reaffirmed. Do we need a post-approval drug safety agency? Well, improved post-market surveillance is a good idea because more information uh, is better. And we are slowly moving in that direction. Right now, we have a voluntary system which doesn't work especially well. We rely on doctors simply to decide when a patient has had a potential adverse drug reaction and to submit that information to the FDA. As we're moving towards electronic records uh, and uh, uh, with, with Kaiser, Permanente, and other big HMOs and things like that, we are moving to create real-time information, very large data sets to be able to an an analyze those and see after a drug has been approved if unusual events start turning up. And remember, we're only going to discover these events after a drug has been approved. Often we won't discover them before it's being approved. So I'm in favor of increased post-market surveillance but here's the important point. Post-market surveillance and pre-market regulation are substitutes. So if we have better post-market surveillance, which I hope we will have, we should reduce, reduce pre-market hurdles. Again, move closer to the pre-62 system. Faster approval times, lower costs, and so forth. All right, let me talk about advertising. Now, traditionally, the FDA has maintained very strict control over pharmaceutical advertising and um, promotion. So much so that in 1992, the Center for Disease Control recommended that women of childbearing age take folic acid, folic acid um, supplements. This is one of their CDC advertisements. Okay? The FDA, however, immediately announced that any food or vitamin manufacturer which used the CDC recommendation on its product or in its labeling or advertising that they would be prosecuted. So it wasn't until uh, years later that Congress passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which uh, took away some of the FDA's powers over advertising, that women began to learn the importance of folic acid as firms began to advertise this. Uh, ironically, uh, the FDA now requires manufacturers to fortify a variety of grain products with folic acid. So as is often the case, that which is not prohibited is mandatory. In fact, there's a whole hidden history, by the way. Somebody needs to write up at some point 
uh, FDA restrictions on advertising. You know, it used to be illegal to label a product with the fat content and the cholesterol content and so forth. Okay, and now it is required. Uh, it actually used to be illegal, like a vitamin store, like GNC, it used to be illegal for a store to sell vitamin and also to sell uh, books, uh, uh, recommended vitamins. So the FDA said that if you sell a book and vitamin, then the book becomes part of the product label and the vitamin becomes a drug and we control the product label. So there's a huge history of restrictions on free speech. Um, this began to change in a series of important legal cases where the courts actually really smacked down the FDA. They said, uh, believe it or not, the uh, First Amendment uh, even applies to firms. Firms have some free speech rights. And a result of these cases, the FDA was forced to allow qualified health claims, which are now graded sort of A, B, C, D, depending upon the evidence. I actually think this is pretty good. This court-ordered model is pretty good. It helps consumers to get information. But the FDA cannot forbid the transmission of information. And as I'll discuss later, I think we ought to extend this model. Before I get there, though, I want to talk about an ethical issue, about who decides. Since all drugs have side effects, every prescription is a trade-off between risk and reward. Now, who is going to decide how this trade-off is to be made? The FDA or the patient and her doctor? Here is Lori Rubenstein. This is from her article in USA Today. Lori Rubenstein says, Lori Rubenstein wants her Vioxx back. Before she began taking Vioxx five years ago, some mornings her body hurt so badly that her husband had to help her dress. She often arrived at work exhausted. Sales of the drug were halted worldwide on September 30th after a study showed it doubled the risk of heart attack and stroke. But for Rubenstein, relief trumps risk. Vioxx, quote, was the best pain drug I've been on in 27 years, says the 47-year-old Manhattan resident who has fibromyalgia, a chronic condition that causes pain in muscles and joints. I felt good enough to do some exercise. Getting to work was not such a difficult thing. I would go back on it in a heartbeat. Perhaps not the best choice of words, okay. but we know what she means. Okay. Here is Robert Buchholz. Robert Buchholz says, I personally took Vioxx ever since it was released. It's the one anti-inflammatory I can take that doesn't upset my stomach. When that was taken off the market, I was personally disappointed. I've got my own personal supply of Vioxx and I'm not about ready to destroy it. All life is a series of risks and you've got to measure the risks versus the benefits and that's true of any drug. Now who is Robert Buchholz? Is he somebody who perhaps needs the FDA's guidance, who perhaps needs the paternalism of the FDA. Robert Buchholz is president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, chair of the orthopedic surgery department at the Medical School, University of Texas Southwestern. Okay. All right, I want to conclude on this note. As I see it, there are two possible models of the FDA, the paternalism model and the consumer reports model. As currently organized, the FDA delays the introduction of new drugs and it raises their costs, thereby producing drug lag and drug loss to the harm of the American people. The FDA is also a paternalistic agency. It substitutes its judgment for the independent judgment of millions of doctors and their patients. It presumes to know what it cannot know, which is the best treatment for individual patients in their varied circumstances of time and place. Now I contrast the FDA with another agency of consumer protection, Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports carefully evaluates and tests new products and services, and it provides information to its readers. But Consumer Reports does not ban products. Consumer Reports gives its readers information on price, function, and quality, and it leaves it to them to best navigate, it leaves it to consumers to best navigate the trade-offs in accord with the consumer's own preferences and constraints. In short, Consumer Reports helps consumers to make better choices rather than making choices for them. In the same way, 
I think there is a role. There is an important role for the FDA and for other agencies like the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, in providing information to help patients and doctors to make better choices, along with those ABCD type claims, okay, to help consumers make better choices. An FDA, which was reorganized on the consumer reports model, would seek to empower patients rather than substituting its own judgment for their judgments. Only, in my belief, only when we have an FDA that truly seeks to empower patients with the tools to make better decisions, only then will we have an FDA which is truly both safe and effective. Thank you very much. Opposed to one another. 
They spend money on marketing in order to make more profit. And if you make more profit, that's what drives the research and development. So the marketing increases the research and development budget. It doesn't come out of the research and development budget. These two things are not opposed. It's the marketing which grows the market, which means that the firms are willing to spend the money doing research and development because we know the market will be large if we can advertise their product. Do you know if there are any studies or any evidence showing a difference in death rates in places like Thailand that's easy to get certain drugs versus the United States? There is very little good data uh, on this. Um, there's some, there's, the, the studies really have not been done. There's one study I can, I can tell you about. Um, it's cited in, at FDA Review. But there are no good studies on it. Let me put it in the same It's unfortunate. To under research area. That's why I think that the off label um, is a very good way of looking at the issue because the off label does give us a point of comparison with the on label system and does suggest uh, something about what the world would look like without the FDA. So it's something we can actually see. Yes. Does uh, prescription drug user fee act which increased the uh, employment? capacity of an FDA and set up the approval process. Did that accomplish anything in the way of reducing the clinical trial costs? Yeah, that's a good question. So the answer is no. Um, so there is the, there's the time at which the uh, FDA receives the new drug application until the time in which we make a decision. That time is reduced. But there's also the entire time that you take to research and develop the uh, drug itself. Now, part of that is outside of the FDA's control. It takes time to do um, uh, animal trials and it takes time to do clinical trials. But part of it is within the FDA control. How many clinical trials do they require? How long do the patients need to be followed before the FDA is willing to make a decision? And um, that, that time has not gone down. So it still does take 12 to 15 years to research a new drug. And that's one reason why the cost of producing new drugs have gone up and not, have not gone down. So I do think Padupa was a good step in the right direction, but we need to take further steps. Can um, I think probably the litigation environment has something to do with it. It's also true if you go to many European countries, um, you know, like playgrounds where the kids could go, and uh, uh, they look a lot more dangerous than the ones in the U.S. So I think there is less of a court system there. I don't know if that's particularly the explanation, uh, but I do think yeah, it's a little peculiar. Uh, but I don't actually know. Uh, I don't actually have a good theory on that. One thing that we do do in Europe is the um, contract out a lot of the approval process itself. So often private firms okay, will run uh, the approval process and, uh, and will report results to the government. The government then makes the final decision. But the testing and the uh, review of new drug applications is often done by private firms uh, in the European Union. And so there's more of a competitive market for doing that. And the government can then Certify the certifiers. Okay. The government can certify the certifiers. And that's another possibility for reform in the United States, to farm out some of this to private corporations. We actually do this for most products for which you're familiar with. Um, if you go to the store and you buy a lamp, uh, you, or you buy a computer or a lamp or something like that, and you look at the bottom, you will see a UL seal, the Underwriters Laboratory. The Underwriters Laboratory is a private, non-profit corporation which reviews hundreds of thousands of uh, products and certifies whether they are safe. It does even does so for the electrical components of medical devices. Um, so we could have a, uh, a, another beneficial reform 
would be to have more firms like Underwriters Laboratory, but reviewing new drug applications rather than labs and computers. So if you know as a pharmaceutical firm that you have the right to advertise your product in the future, you can estimate uh, what the size of the market will be. And if you don't have the right, if your marketing rights are re reduced, you will know in advance, in expectation, that the market is going to be smaller. So I think it, expectationally, the argument uh, does go through. Uh, I was wondering, as a result of the center, center pad controversy, were there any um, reforms either within the FDA or imposed upon the FDA by Congress to change the way they evaluated devices like that that were fairly simple and straightforward? No. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, basically no. So periodically we have, uh, So there, were, there, there was a, periodically, this issue, these types of issues come up, and the Congress uh, uh, makes a big fuss, but nothing ever really changes. So uh, we, there is a so-called fast-track approval process, and before that, there was a, um, a super approval process for special drugs, but the, the time it takes a drug to be uh, a research and develop has been going up, the expenses have been going up, the number of clinical trials required has been going up, so there have been no fundamental changes. Padufa is the only, is really the only big fundamental change um, that I know of that worked in the right direction. It was in the right direction. It's the only one. Um, you mentioned going back to it in 1962, uh, where the FDA only right. regulates safety. Um, do you think that going back to a safety only regulation will increase the ineffective? or the inefficacy rate of new drugs. And um, a follow-up question to that is, uh, is there any research going back to the pre-62 method on uh, the rate of efficacy pre and post-1962? Okay. Um, so the system that I would, uh, one of the systems I would be in favor of is going back to safety only with a optional certification. So I would still want uh, a, 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 the potential for firms to run their drugs through the FDA to get that stamp, perhaps in conjunction with other private groups offering their stamp of approval. Now, if we went back to safety only, would I expect more um, non-effective drugs okay, to be on the market? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, I would. I would expect more ineffective drugs, and indeed, this is hard to say, but yes, I would expect that if we went to a safety only, we would have more drugs on the market which would show adverse reactions and which would be, you know, bad drugs, okay? This is where you, uh, you need a hard, harder economist, okay, to really look this in the eye and say yes. But I think the problem is the drugs today are actually too safe in some sense, okay? That is, I believe that we would have more new drugs and that the number of people who were benefited by those new drugs, which would be on the market quicker, so more new drugs on the market and available sooner, the number of people who would benefit that would far exceed the number of people who would be harmed by additional inefficacious in drugs. But I'm going to be completely honest, yes, I think that if we went back to a pre-62 system, we would have more inefficient, non-effective drugs on the market. But I think that trade-off is worth it. I think that trade-off overall, we would have more drugs to battle disease, to reduce the death toll from disease. And that's 
the other side of the trade act that we must keep our eye on. Um, on the 62, post 62, um, yes, uh, Peltzman actually did look at that question, and he found, remember the data there was that post 62, the number of new drugs expected was 40, the actual number of new drugs was 16. So was it the case that the drugs we lost were just the bad ones? And he runs three or four different types of tests, and the answer is no. The answer is no. It seems that uh, we lost good drugs as well as, equally as well as bad drugs. So he, he, he does look at that issue uh, in his uh, paper. In the last week, I've been interested to see that Paramavir has been approved for emergency use authorization um, for severe cases of swine flu, H1N1 in the hospital. And I wondered if you could, if you could talk, if you have anything interesting to comment on on that particular one. And also, this was the first time I'd ever heard of uh, emergency use authorization, and I don't know if it is in fact the first time that Ever happened. Right. Um, I don't know uh, the details of that uh, specific case. Um, you know, we, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, producing vaccines is not very profitable, and it's not very profitable because of a lot of price controls and regulations. So we only have essentially a government system for producing vaccines, and it looks like we're way behind this year. Uh, we were supposed to have, at this point in time, we were supposed to have 100 million doses. It looks like we only have something like 22 million doses at this point in time. We'll have more um, as the months wear on, but we don't have as much as we wanted. So I think that is a problem. But the whole vaccine issue is another large, another large issue. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for being here. My question is, uh, in your research of other countries, similar organizations of, like the FDA, do you feel that they are under the same visibility consequences and repercussions as our RFDA in type one type errors? Right. Yeah, let's go back to the other question of why is it that uh, Europe, uh, at least through, at least until Peruza, you know, through the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, was uh, quicker, and I, I, I think that's a good, uh, that's an excellent question, and I'm actually not sure why the incentives were different, because the logic of it is, is still the case. Now, remember, of course, that um, in Europe, uh, they were quicker relative to the United States, but they may still be slow relative to an ideal standard. But as to why it worked there, whether it's different with a parliamentary system or with a presidential system, whether the fact that the bureaucracy is at the level of the European Union rather than at a particular country, whether it's because it's competition um, between some of the um, uh, countries, uh, whether because the pharmaceutical firms have some choices. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, least, the political economy reasons were, why uh, the European system was better. But the fact that it was data does not come to pass. So it's a good question. I, I wonder why. What does it take to uh, privatize the FDA and who will get hurt if the uh, FDA was privatized? Right, so I don't think you quite need to necessarily privatize the USA, but this is the FDA. Uh, you should privatize the USA. Freud is flipped. But I think one of the first steps we can do is to. Um, is to certify certifiers. So instead of the FDA uh, going through all of the documentation and deciding whether a drug is to be approved or not, they could say, okay, here are the conditions we need these firms to establish, we need so many people, whatever, blah, 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 and we will certify the certifiers. So to create a competitive market in firms like Underwriters Laboratory, which would then review NDAs. I think that would be a beneficial first first step. Um, briefly, we had that for medical devices, um, but the FDA, of course, was never much in favor of farming out you know, their job. Bureaucracies never like to shrink themselves. So that, unfortunately, never went very far. There wasn't a big push for it. Hi. Um, I just have a 
question. Would there be, a, have you thought of any alternative uh, methods for inducing the FDA to focus more on type 2 forms, or, or I think the type 2 error that? Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, the, you know, the only time this has happened was really with the AIDS activists. And that was really the first time uh, the, the AIDS activists, of course, knew that uh, their, their, their family, their friends had this deadly disease. And so they really, for the first time ever, put pressure on the FDA to speed up drug approvals. And so that was an unusual case. I think of a highly organized group, a very committed group, and one which literally has a sort of sort of Damocles hanging over them. Um, so patients groups, I think, since the AIDS activists have become more aware of this issue. Uh, so it's gotten a little bit better, but there is some attention to the type 2 error. But the AIDS, it's never been as strong as with the AIDS activists. That's the only example I know. People going from Secretary of Treasury to Goldman Sachs, for example, and from Goldman Sachs to Secretary of the Treasury. So I don't think the FDA is particularly unusual um, in this regard, uh, and I don't know the comparison uh, with you. What is a prescription drug and what is a non prescription drug? And I do agree that um, by keeping many drugs uh, as a prescription only, that certainly increases the demand for the services of AMA uh, members. Uh, so, to a large extent, I think that's another type of issue. But we ought to move drugs, not all of them, but we ought to move some drugs more quickly to uh, over the counter uh, status. We have a question in the back, and then front, and then back. This is um, somewhat of a hypothetical question. Um, it seems to me that only physicians or direct, you know, frontline healthcare providers would have the proper incentives to pay attention equally or appropriately to both type one and type two errors. Because they're going to, you know, have to the attention will, will, will focus on them regardless. Either. So I'm wondering if in a pure free market with only um, you know, private certification providers, would there be that much of a role for those even, given that given that I think they would face the same incentive to pay more attention to type one errors than the type two? well I, I agree that physicians are on the front line and do see probably more clearly than the average person. Um, there's a possibility of both types of error. Uh, and physicians also see over time that new drugs, not in every case, not all the time, but each generation of new drugs typically is better than the last. So physicians see in the way in a way in which patients do not that delay of new drugs can um, uh, uh, can harm uh, uh, patients. Um, I also think that you're right that it's not simply that the FDA is a bad agency. That's not it. 
I mean, the FDA is responding to incentives. And it's the public, the public doesn't recognize this trade-off as well as it could. So when the public sees 10 people, 20 people die from some new drug, you know, the public over-interprets that. It's like, you know, it's like thinking that plane crashes are more dangerous than automobiles. You know, when, uh, when in fact automobiles are from mile are more dangerous. So, but the plane crashes are more um, salient. You know, they're on the news. And same thing, when people die from a bad drug, that is media-worthy, that it gets in the news. And that patient error, or that person error, people error, that bias in our thinking, I think drives much of the FDA's incentives. So in that sense, I think we all have a job to do, which is to bear in mind these trade-offs, is not to forget that when we require more testing, when we require longer trials, that means fewer new drugs. It means more expensive drugs. It means fewer new drugs. It means more delay. It means patients die. But those patients, you can only see them as in theory. You, you, need, you need to think at several steps ahead. It's like the invisible hand. Okay? You need to kind of see a little bit in more depth than to see the patients who die because of the bad drugs. Those are right in your face. You need a little bit of theory, a little bit of analysis. So I think we all have a job to do in thinking more clearly about these trade-offs. Is it legal to go abroad and buy drugs that have not been approved by the FDA and bring them back? And if so, why isn't there a bigger industry of uh, foreign countries, especially nearby ones like in Mexico, uh, providing those drugs which have not been approved? Right. I know some of that goes on people go abroad. Right. Seems to me not that much. Right. So, uh, two parts. Is it legal? Um, yes, but you may be hassled. So, um, uh, it, is, it is legal for personal use only, and you may be hassled, and you may be required to have a prescription, even from your doctor, even for the drug that doesn't, you know, is not allowed in, in the U.S. So, yes, there is a sort of personal e e exemption, but it's, you certainly cannot ship them. Um, but there's some data. Now, why do we see more of that? Well, I think part of the reason is, is that the U.S. is by far the largest and biggest drug market, uh, market for new pharmaceuticals in the world. So when the cost of producing a new pharmaceutical are high in the United States to get that pharmaceutical approved, okay, that affects the entire world. So if there are fewer new drugs in the U.S., that means fewer new drugs for the world. So our FDA policy influences the number of new drugs everywhere. Now, perhaps as other countries, other large countries become rich, you know, as uh, China and India become rich, we may see that change somewhat. If the Chinese and Indian markets are as large as the market in the United States, um, and we have different, we have choose a different regulatory approach, then we may see a big change. But we are not there yet, of course. To, and those economies are not rich enough yet to support the pharmaceutical market like we have in the United States. And until that happens, U.S. drug policy is world drug policy. Hush, is there any evidence that American consumers began exercising less personal responsibility at, uh, for ensuring effectiveness after the FDA uh, took responsibility for that? Or in other words, did more people look at consumer reports before they bought drugs in the 60s than they, than they do now? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to say. I, so I don't have any information on that. Um, as I mentioned, Pelican and his piece um, doesn't find any differences in the effectiveness of the drug pre and post uh, 62. Of course, nowadays there is much more patient empowerment through because of the internet, because information is so much easier to obtain. And another aspect of this, which I'm going to talk about, which I think is clearly coming down the line, is that drugs are going to become much more personalized, you know, even down to your genetic code. So in a certain sense, the FDA is going to have no choice but to reduce regulation, uh, at least I hope, uh, because drugs are going to become so much more personalized. You know, a big issue today is that what, is, what works for one patient may actually harm another patient. 
the better we can precisely identify through understanding the precise pharmaceutical properties of a drug and a person's genetic code, that we can actually tailor drugs for individuals. And as we do that, we're going to need less regulation. If um, the FDA were to move towards safety only and away from the efficacy, so therefore the period of drug approval would be much less, would you be in favor of reducing the period of act on pharmaceuticals? Oh. Um, yeah, I think we can certainly have um, pharmaceutical patents which are too long. Um, you know, one issue in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, a, form, you know, a patent uh, is uh, supposed to last uh, 20 years, probably. Um, but the pharmaceutical firms had to apply for a patent before the drug would get through the FDA process. So this means that the patent started running while the drug was still in the FDA pipeline, was still not approved. So the effective patent life was actually going down as the time to get a drug through the FDA process was going up. So uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, the effective patent life on a pharmaceutical might have been only eight, nine, ten years. Now, uh, uh, since that time, we've actually allowed a uh, five years uh, uh, a catch-up. So if your uh, if your drug is in the FDA process for five years, you get to you know move your clock five years back. So even today, however, the effective patent life is still considerably less than um, 20 years. Um, and actually, the patent life is even less than the legal life because um, once you have a, a second drug in the same class, uh, you know, the patent becomes worth quite a bit less, quite a bit less. So the patent life on pharmaceuticals is not as long as people think. So your point, I think, is well taken that if we allow a larger market sooner, then we ought to reduce the patent length time. I think that's a big point. Yeah. Okay, we have reached the end of our, uh, almost the end, although I still have a microphone, so I get to actually ask the last question. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> um, I'm just curious, do we have any data on the, the, either the number, dollar volume of uh, off-label writing that's going on versus online. Yeah, um, so it varies by drug class. Um, uh, and it, so in, uh, for example, in um, psycho, uh, uh, psychological drugs, so drugs, you know, the psychological diseases, or the social, or, I'm not using that term correctly, but for those, it's a majority. The majority is off-label. And you can kind of see why, okay? It's because we actually don't have very good knowledge of how the brain functions. And the brain functions differently for different people. So it's very common that uh, you, you, you're, you have a problem with depression or with something else, and you get the standard treatment, and the standard treatment just fails. That's very common. So a lot of drug use in that field is uh, off-label, a majority of it. Um, in, other, in areas which are advancing very quickly, such as, um, as I mentioned, AIDS and cancer research. A lot of drugs are also off-label because um, people are, are reading scientific literature all the time, and they're looking for something which, which might work. So they're, they're very concerned about that. In more ordinary cases, if you go to your physician for you know, some type of problem, it'll be an on-label use. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kavar for coming in. Questions, please join us for uh, something at the Fairmont afterwards. Uh, let me remind you that November 19th we'll have our next or final for this semester uh, provocative lecture, which will be uh, um, Kenneth uh, Shockman, who will be here from Safeway to talk about their market based healthcare program and the um, success they've had with reining in costs using a market based approach. So I encourage you to be here. This will be another edition of the discussion about healthcare that's raging through the country. 
I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 Than